Better Listen presents The Alchemy of Psychology The Color White with James Hillman It isn't that it's the color of death. White is the color of transcendence and uh, heaven, the beyond. So if you go to the beyond and transcend through death, then white is the color of death. It's the color of purity and that kind of thing, and has a terrible shadow to it. The shadow of exclusion. Uh, I think there are just all kinds of shadows. And the word shadow, as defined in Jungian psychology, is the parts of the personality that are I think unacceptable to the ego, something like that. Um, the shadow is not necessarily a guiding spirit in the same way. Um, see, the trouble we have here is genius is not a concept. Genius is a figure born at birth with a whole history. Shadow is an invention of psychology. When we try to fit these things together, we lose something all the time. If I talk about angels and geniuses, we're doing something different than if we're talking about shadows and persona. So we got to it somehow drop some of the, and not drop, but at least relativize some of the psychological language. Now I keep referring back to it because that's our current currency, but I can do more in my fantasy, my imagination, with the idea that when I was born there was a genius born with me, and that that's an invisible twin, and I don't know what it's after, and that that had a destiny in it, rather than the shadow as the part of the ego that I have to reject, because that that sets up an ego. I don't even know what that is. You know, I'm, I'm caught in a conceptual world that I can't properly imagine, and I'm literalized, I'm trapped into psychology. See, the, the, the struggle, the reason I'm doing this course is to free us from psychology. We don't know how it dominant it is in, the, in our minds. It runs our minds. Two things run our minds, psychology and economics. They run our minds. They are the gods of our culture. And everything that's, that's inside is psychological, and we've got all this tremendous vocabulary. We've got birds flying around in there with, with labels all over them, and we've got, we've got economics. And those are the way we understand everything. And I'm trying to get psychology freed of, of, of the psyche freed of psychology. Not that this is better, it's just different and works as a, as a remedy. Yeah, then yeah. Then, then red. I mean, I don't think the idea is that if a la- a yeah, I'll make I'll say it again. If a language has a, any color terms at all, they will be black and white. If the language has a third term for color, it'll be red, and that they say is universal. Their third term won't be green or yellow or brown. It'll they be red. Really figure out the order in which they no, no, no. They say if they, they take the language of a of a people somewhere in central India, and they look for the co- words for color, they find they only have two words for color: dark and light, black and white. And then they find oh, they have a third word for color, and that word is is blood, or it's red, or it's red earth, or something like that. And it isn't some other. There's no other other word. Then if, if a language has four words, that fourth word will be yellow or green. There are some cultures that only have th- uh, two or three, yes. I don't know the names, I'm sorry. I can give you the reference to the paper. You can read the paper and all the arguments about it. The, uh, the men are called Berlin and Kay, 
basic color terms. University of California, 1969. And then there was an enormous amount of people writing after that on it, showing that Berlin and Kay had missed among the Samoan a certain color, or the Mohawks, or the Hair Indians, or the Beanies, and so on. But this basic idea is sort of accepted. And if you are curious about the white, red, and black in Africa, there is a, a book called Color Symbolism published by Spring. And there's a paper by Zahan, who is a major uh, Euro uh, um, um, anthropologist. Is that in Spring Annual? No, that's in um, a book, a separate book called Color Symbolism. These primary colors that I mentioned, the four primary colors, uh, black, white, yellow, and red, are also co can be coordinated with the four in the Hippocratic system of the um, fluids, the humors, as they were called, in which the white was the lymph and the phlegm and the type of personality that was phlegmatic. The red was the sanguine personality, uh, realistic, saw things as they are, bloody-minded, as the British would say, and they that would be the red. And the black was the, the, uh, the black bile, and the yellow was the yellow bile of cholera, from which cholera and also uh, being angry, yellow bile. And this idea that all things in in uh, all things in certain tribe in, in tribal systems, all things can be coordinated according to colors. So certain foods, certain trees, certain seasons, certain earth, certain places, certain states of the soul, certain ancestors, certain genders, animals, so on, belong to the black, belong to the white, belong to the red. That's a very heavy symbolism. But it isn't quite meant as a symbolism. It's meant as these are powers. And the unifying principle among all these strange things, leopards, gum trees, uh, uh, waterfalls, so on and so forth, would be one of the colors. So that gives them a, a tremendous... Uh, significance. You see, just before we break for lunch, the world was organized by qualities once. Y you would want to know what something was and where it belonged and whether it did things for you or did things against you or how it belonged in the world. You would look at the thing. And if it was rough and scaly and hard and appeared mostly in the winter, like some kind of a hickory nut or so, you knew that was a Sat that belonged to the realm of Saturn, and it was therefore useful all through the realms of Saturn in different ways. And if it was prickly and sharp and peppery, and or had thorns, or it burnt, or it burnt easily, or it could be colored red, or so it belonged to the realm of Mars, and you knew what to do with it. So the whole world, everything you looked at, you could read the intentions of things according to their qualities. And you knew the organizing principles of where to put things according to their qualities. And those were the seven planets, or they were the seven gods, who also appear in, in alchemy. Now, we don't have that. We, we have a dictionary. You want to know what something is, you look it up. And then you find these words, ostrich, osmosis, osteopath, os and you wonder, what the hell of these, you know, if you come from another planet and you open the dictionary, you read these things, you wonder what have they got to do with each other? What has osteopath to do with ostrich to do with osmosis? I have no idea. What? Well, in this case, let's imagine they have nothing, you don't know what they have to do with each other till you learn the code, which is the alphabet. 
once you've learned the codes of the alphabet, you see why things are next to each other, why they've been grouped together, and how to, how to work out the system. But we don't, if you don't have the alphabet, if you land here from another planet out of Star Trek, you don't know what the hell's going on here. You don't know how this world is organized. Because people aren't looking at things to decide what belongs with what. They're not using their senses to perceive the world. They're using an abstract system for organizing the world. Oh, yeah. But I'm not interested in them. I'm saying what happens when you land here and want to understand ours. <laughs> I'm not going to them. They're coming here right now. So, so you, you see, in another time and in another part of our history, and in other parts of the world, people understand the world through qualities, through reading qualities. So you had to have your senses awake. You had to know what a thing did. And then you learned where it belonged. And then you wouldn't eat that on a certain day because that day belonged to another principle, and so on. It gets, it gets into endless taboos and all that. But at least what that system did, unlike ours, it required a sense, a quality, a sense of quality. And you had to use your senses to understand the world. You had to read the world. You had to really be interested in that kind of grass and why it's different from that kind of grass. And you, you become more like an animal because that's how horses read the world. You know, they eat that, but they won't eat that. And why? They lost a lot of ancestors, probably eating the wrong thing. And probably we did too. Uh, it's time for lunch. <laughs> this, is a, this is an alchemical, very famous alchemical saying from a woman called Mary the Prophet, Maria Prophetessa, or Mary the Jewess. Now, Mary the Jewess was supposed to, it's a legendary figure in Egypt who invented certain, she invented the the uh, what you call in French cooking the bain marie, the double boiler, and uh, so you could say that the whole business of alchemy goes back to a Jewish lady's cooking, <laughs> but because from that comes all kinds. So one of her great sentences was, "If the two do not become one, nothing will take place. If one does not whiten, and the two become three, nothing will take place." There's other little things in there with white sulfur, which whitens. But when one yellows, three becomes four, for one yellows with yellow sulfur. At the end, climax, when one tints into violet, all things combine into violet. So you know that people sit down and they work that out. That would be a formula for knowing how to do the whole work. Doesn't make sense. Right? So that's what all the alchemists were doing. They had these kinds of very famous sayings, and then they would try to work out the formula for how to do it. But do you notice it has to do with color? That's all. It has to do with number, and it has to do with color. All I wanted to read it for was to show you how whitening has to happen, and then after whitening, yellowing has to happen, and after the yellowing, iosis has to happen, and iosis meant... Uh, Viol making violet or making purple or making red. Pardon? It could be Miriam, sometimes it's attributed to the sister of Moses, a Miriam, and so on. But it was much, I think the, the, the person was probably much later than Moses' sister. Um... I hope I've been able to get over to you that there are no good colors and bad colors, that green can be uh, the color of uh, mold and decay, and green can be the color of uh, new, li new life, buds and leaves, that yellow can be the color of old teeth, and yellow can be the color of uh, sunshine and gold. And red can be the color of danger, and red can be the color of um, vitality and blood. So, so 
that's all the way through that way. B black can be the color of uh, darkness, and black can be the color of the, the earth and richness, and so on. That's rather important that we keep that in mind, because otherwise we get these symbolic values laid on them. Okay, now, now let us begin to talk a little bit about black. I want to start with reading you the immense prejudice in our culture about black, which has huge sociological uh, implications. God, what did I do with the paper that I was reading those? I've got to find this. This is crucial. Yeah. When the word black in the Oxford English Dictionary before the English landed on the coasts of West Africa and saw people who had darker skins than they had. They, the word black, which was the first word they used about those people, and I am now talking about the history of white, what we call white consciousness, you and me. The meaning of this, of black, before the 16th century, that is, before the explorers or, or uh, investigators, discoverers, as they're called, exploiters, whatever you want to call them, slave traders, whoever they were, before they got to the coast of West Africa, what they carried in the baggage of their language when they saw the people on the coast and called them black, which was the first epithet used, not naked, not curly-haired, not they, the first word used about the people they saw for the first time was the word black. When they used that word, they carried in their mind this, these ideas. The meaning of black before the 16th century included deeply stained with dirt, soiled, dirty, foul, having dark or deadly purposes, malignant, pertaining to or involving death, deadly, baneful, disastrous, sinister, foul, iniquitous, atrocious, horrible, wicked, indicating disgrace, censure, liability to punishment, and so on. Liability to punishment, just, just that phrase. That justifies whatever you do. Liability to punishment, censure, disgrace, horrible, wicked. The word white was not used by Western Europeans about themselves until after they used the word black about other people. None of the ancient peoples called themselves white. The word white became, a react, in, a, in a sense, is a reaction to the use of the word black. Now, if you see it that way, you begin to see that all these properties attributed to black are not in white. These are the origins of white supremacy, and also the origins of white supremacy in the nature of the attributes of the colors. Because if we go back to Victor Turner and so on, that certain that colors carry with them a whole archetypal power, then what is what we say about black and white is loaded with all kinds of uh, what do you want to say? just not prejudices, but with meanings that are already there. Now, with black, um, no, to go on with the political part, in the United States, um, the uh, the Christians in Massachusetts, by the middle of the 17th century, the Massachusetts colonies had begun to use a new word for themselves, which was white. To be Christian was to be white. Even though there were people of African descent who were in uh, the churches. But the identification of Christianity with whiteness became a fundamental part of the way our minds work. So this is a very deep, very old, and very uh, powerful chapter in 
the use of the word white and black in our social world. Now, about the color itself in alchemy. This business of the negredo, as it's called, N-I-G-R-E-D-O, negredo, you see that word a lot when you're looking at alchemy things. Negredo. The white is called albedo, and the red is called rubedo. It's very easy to uh, talk about negredo, very difficult to be in it. When you're in negredo, you feel bad and you don't want to talk about it, except to complain. Whereas when you get to the blue, it's much harder to talk about that. It comes out in other ways, like music, but much easier to be in the blues. In the negredo, um, the alchemists say that the primary material must be cooked, must be made blacker than black, must be made black as a crow's head, must be black all the way through. That is, after you've cooked it for 40 days and it is still not black, or it, is, it seems to be black, then you cook it again for another 40 days till it is blacker than black than black. Now, the idea there is that we jump out of the black condition so quickly and so easily. We want to escape from depression, doom, sadness, despair, paralysis, um, all the qualities that go with no, not being able to see forward, sinking down, um, looking back. And the sense of being weak and poor and unable and have no confidence, no esteem, these are the black, the blackened materia prima. It seems it has no future, it has no hope, it can't go forward. Hope is the color, is green, is the color of hope is green, as you know. And it's very difficult to do any reflecting. Classical depression is one in which you go around in the same dark place and you can't see your way out, you can't see your way forward, and you keep going down and back. You keep thinking about what you did wrong, you feel guilty, you feel your mind is closed in on itself in darkness, poverty, uh, humiliation, and so. And it's very stuck. Now, the way this black um, could be made, that is, it, when I say cooked, it could be made through different operations, and you've probably gone through these operations in your life often enough. One of them is the putrefaction. That is, things putrefy, they rot. You're in a relationship and you say, this stinks. i got to get out of here. I can't stand it anymore. It stinks. And you can feel the marriage rotting. That's the putrefying of a relationship. And it's, black, it's blackening the relationship. It seems to have no hope. You go to a marriage therapist to find some hope. But or couples therapy or whatever, but the idea here is that it's putrefying, it's rotting. Another word for this process of making black was the mortificatio, or the mortifying. Things were dying, things are dying. Another one was the calcination. And I'm going to go into these processes in more detail at another time, but I just want to say that this is how blackening is made. Calcination was drying something to a powder. All the moisture goes out of it. Now, what's that? What does that mean, all the moisture goes out of it? Well, on the one hand, all the humor goes out of it, all the juice goes out of it, all the... Uh, the uh, sense of being able to have imagination go or fantasy goes out of it, and you're left with a kind of dry state that's just the same. 
Does any of this ring bells in your lives? <laughs> this would be the making of, this would be blackening the psyche. Now why did you have to do this? Why go through all that? Well, in the alchemical work, the blackening is in order to um, burn out, dry out, and, and uh, torture all the wrong hope the wrong desires, the wrong um, claims, expectations, uh, all the stuff, it's like initiation, all the stuff you come in with. So all that has to uh, die away or dry out or disappear. And I think it has a lot to do with the, the work in, in the arts. Uh, Faulkner says you have to kill the rose. Kill the roses, I think, is the phrase he uses. In other words, you find you write a sentence that's lovely. You have to kill that. Take that stuff out. You have to blacken your work. You have to darken it. You have to you have to put bitterness into it. It has to have it has to have salt and lead, and the dark qualities. Otherwise, it goes off into the sweet balloons. If it doesn't have the touch of despair, it doesn't touch the human heart. I think a lot of psychology, st it's, in psychology this is called the reductive phase of analysis. That is, you're supposed to reduce, um, at least in classical Jungian analysis, the reduction came before the synthesis. That is, you reduce a person to his shadow, to all the parts of the personality that you don't like, you don't accept, are embarrassed by, all the dark parts of your life, your moral, your historical, your, uh, your uh, personal uh, mess, which brings you down and makes you feel uh, a failure or makes you feel um, unable, or, you know, you're, you're, you're just, uh, you're nothing. And this black is evidently built in because so many writers and philosophers, just as the other, the internal pattern was inherent, or the ug sense of ugliness is inherent, so this negredo is inherent. Um, Philosopher writers, one after another, mention it in one way or another. Emerson speaks of a silent melancholy that's in all souls. Thoreau says, most men live lives of quiet desperation. These are statements of the negredo. Socrates talks about ignorance as being the worst state of the soul. Coleridge writes a poem called Dejection. Uh, Hopkins ends one of his poems, The Leaden Echo, with despair, 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 despair. Five times. Lear puts uh, into one of his speeches, never, never, never. How, how many times does he do it? Three or four times? Or is it nothing? Nothing. No, five times. Nothing. Never five times. Okay. See, that, that is very Negredo talk. First, the word nothing, or despair, second, the repetition of it. Now, alchemy had a word for the repetition. It's one of the processes. There are, some alchemists have 64 different process, um, activities or operations, like, like I mentioned, um, what did I say, mortification, putrefaction, calcination. One of them was itera iteratio, or the repetition. And this repetition is one of the ways of blackening. Oh, Jesus, will this never change? I keep doing the same thing. Why does the psyche keep doing the same thing? You don't want to do the same thing. You want to get out of it. You want to get moving. You want to start the next thing. The psyche keeps doing the same thing. Lear says, never, never. Is that it? Never, 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 never. Why does he have to say that? And why does Coleridge say despair? Oh, no, Hopkins. You know, and, and the ode to dejection is similar. They're very, very, there's no movement. 
And that is the blackening of the black. There's no movement. You can't escape. And it's, so it either must bring to you the sense of fate or the sense of tragedy. It's the deep, it makes the soul deeper. Uh, that's the only way I can understand it, because why does the soul do this? Yeah. We waste our sorrow. Yeah. Into. Well, just into. When the negredo does not mean going through it. It's not Good Friday and Easter's two days away. It's not that. It's, it's being in it. And the feeling is there's no hope and no change. You're nailed. Uh, it's the only way I can understand it. Uh, whatever happens, and somehow the psyche keeps pushing you to do at, at a time, pushing you there. I, I how often it happens depends on different lives and so on. You think that's what it was? Nailed. Uh, yeah, that was his experience. I'm, I'm sort of just imitating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the way it's it's become a quick weekend, Friday to Sunday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it, whoever fault. Uh, it's just I just didn't want to use that. the the point is is the light at the end of the tunnel model keeps it from being really blackened. That's all. That's right. Another one. Great. The horror, the horror. Right. Um, now, there's a lot made of this phase. I think there are whole psychologies that stay there. The psychology of reduction. That is, you feel yourself to be and have theories of yourself as um, uh, impoverished, abused, um, caused by the past, um, disempowered. Uh, these are negredo, they're psychologies that speak to the negredo part of the psyche and give it an account that's not the whole story. So the repetition of never, never, never is a psychic state in which never, never, never just goes on. Yeah. Well, if it's an echo, you're implying that it'll eventually drift away and diminishes. It's going to go away. Now, let's just imagine that these are different ways of imagining the same thing. What I like about repetition is that it's also rehearsal. A repetition is what you do in the theater. In fact, that's the word, isn't it, for a rehearsal, a repetition? But a probe is a proof or a probe, isn't it? I mean, a, uh, a test, a trial. It's a trial. Trial, too. Yeah, I, I heard try, but I'm adding a trial. <laughs> Pardon? So it's partly what you said, Don, about getting thing, getting it right. But the rehearsal doesn't ever have to lead to a performance. It's just that the repetition, the wheel. It, it, it's Sisyphus, too. It's part of the, that myth of just going on with it. it yeah, mantras are repetition, yes. Yeah, but the, the, yeah, they are in order, you do the mantra for a purpose. I'm talking about what the psyche is doing to you. Yeah. Sure. So you do learn some things sometimes. What do you pick up? You pick up endurance or stamina. You pick up the sense of, of um, futility of the will. <coughs> Terribly important. You know, a futile was a, a, was a Latin word for a vessel that, that couldn't stand up by itself. It kept falling over. <laughs> Didn't have a proper bottom to it. <laughs> so you learn that, the futility of the will. Uh, 
What else? What other things do you get? Yes? Yes. Yeah. So when you are in the state, as we now talk about being disempowered, that could be a negredo condition. And one probably has to be blackened all the way through to realize how disempowered one is, how, how the will can't do any of this. I mean, I think that has to be felt. Not that that's, you know, the way to live life or something. I just want to say that that's an important experience. There's nothing I can do about it. You had heard of it in association with the whitening. Yeah. Uh, in, in as much as it is, it can... I think these things can happen at any time, but the point is that if the primary material is moist, then the operation will be to dry it. Now, what does that mean? And calcination is drying intense heat used for drying the substance, reducing it to a white powder or whatever. Now, what is a moist condition? First, we'd have to describe that. Well, a moist condition that needs blackening would be uh, misty, foggy, full of uh, 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 sentimentality, tears, uh, a wet soul. That's not, you know, sappy, green, uh, wet behind the ears, uh, uh, juicy, uh, overflowing. Like Ganymede, a cupbearer to the gods, I just run around in heaven giving nectar out. Uh, that, that condition would then be calcined, that is, would be put into a uh, what well, enthusiasm is pro- probably the best word. Going with the flow. Hey, you know, just going with the flow. That's that's the moist soul. Now, so calcination would be a drying up of that. That can happen through life, and it can also happen through heat. So when the person, I mean, in in alchemy it happens through heat. So when a person gets into a position where the heat is on, he's in trouble with the law, and in trouble with a relationship, and in trouble, you know, the heat is on in all different ways. He can, then the calcining begins to happen, and the moisture dries up. The whole process of nature, according to the alchemical model, and it goes back to Heraclitus and all, is that life is a drying. We still use the term in alcoholism dried out. but And the fear of drying out affects all kinds of uh, writing, people who write, afraid of drying out. So the idea was that the younger you were, the moister you were, and the older you were, the drier you were. The moon governed your youth, and Saturn governed your age. The moon was phlegmatic and moist, and so on. Yeah. But is that not in a certain way of being disembodied? Which? That, you know, drying and Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because yeah. alchemy has two principles. One is like cures like, and the other one is cure through the opposite. <laughs> so it's both. So there is some, like, like... Yes, like, yes, like, yes. Alchemy. No, no. So it's both, you know, um, Ayurvedic medicine and the other medicine. It's both. Yes. Well, this bears directly to it. Listen to this little passage. If you allow these vapors, which are continuous when the embryo is formed, to escape, your work will be hopelessly marred. Vapors. Nor should you allow any of the odor to make its way through any little hole or outlet for the evaporation would considerably weaken the strength of the stone. Hence the true sage seals up the mouth of his vessel most carefully. (laughs) 
So one of the ways of building heat is closing down, secrecy, isolation, the closed container. Boyle's Law, is that right? Have I got that one right? <laughs> you build up the pressure, and pressure builds up the heat. Yeah. You can feel it when you have a deadline. It builds up the heat. But that's a very nice sentence. If you allow these vapors to escape, your work will be ho hopelessly marred. So that's the idea of the hermetic vessel, and you don't talk about it or you, other ways of escape. And the other part was, nor should you allow any of the odor to make its way through any little hole or outlet. What's this odor? The stench of your misery. The stench of your depression. The stench of things going foul and rotten. To be around depressed people, the whole atmosphere smells. If, if one member of a family is severely depressed and the whole family is there, it's like living in, under a cloud of, of great stench. Very heavy, very hard. Freud said the family is the dictatorship of the most neurotic member. <laughs> Today we no longer can tell who that is. <laughs> Then be double, he goes on, then be doubly careful and you will at the end of another fortnight, he gives you his time schedule, find that the earth has become quite dry and of a deep black. This is the death of the compound. The winds have ceased. The winds have ceased. And there is a great calm. Our chaos is then ready. <laughs> Great, isn't it? Our chaos is then ready. From which, at the bidding of God, all the wonders of the world may successively emerge. You see, things are reduced to chaos. The chaos is then. What you've been working on all this time, the winds have ceased, everything's stopped, you finally, it's finally ready, and what's ready is the chaos. You don't have any idea. There is no order left. All that is gone, too. What comes first, what comes second, what's more important, what's less important, all that structure is gone. And if you know your myths, you know that chaos and eros are born. Eros is born out of chaos, or so on. As Othello says, chaos come round. When, when what's-her-name dies, Desdemona dies, he says, chaos come back, or chaos come round again, or something. Because when the Eros is gone, chaos comes. When out of chaos comes Eros. That was a little piece on the black. I have some more on the black. I think it's enough of the black, actually. <laughs> <laughs> enough of the black. Yes. Yes. Well, yes. Mm hmm. Oh, no, no, don't, ad that's just, that one little passage says it's chaos. Don't take that too literally. Yeah, I No, actually, these are names for the prima materia, but the, the negredo can produce, finally, a, new, a condition that results from something else, and then it's a chaos. And that chaos is a big C, and it could mean the uncreated, the, that which is about to be. It's an egg, is another way of seeing it. Yeah. Yes. Is the negredo a process? Well, the way I described things were that there are things that go on during the negredo. It's a state. When you're in it, you don't feel it's a process. You feel you're in a stasis, in a state. The only thing that is proceeding is repetition. That's what it seems to be. Sure. Or new phases of humiliation. Yeah. <laughs> but 
But you see, you're thinking in terms of I am cooking it. Better to think that you're being cooked. And that's the, that's the victim condition. You used the word surrender. Where's, where's, uh, oh, she's gone out. Yeah. Anyway, she used the word surrender. But now psychotherapy uses the word victim. But that's negredo language again. You're a victim of, of, the, of the work. That's all the Holocaust, survivor, victim. This is Negredo talk. Yes. Oh. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Probably it's just as well it doesn't know that. But maybe it does know it, you know. That's another thing. We don't know what it knows. It's an incubation, which is another word uh, that's used. Um, so when you use the word victim, then you're, yeah, but I mean, when the word victim is used, it suggests that it's caused by other people and it shouldn't have happened. Yeah, and that's a mistake. Yeah. Rather than an initiatory incubation. It becomes projective also into history. See, I think history is the vast field of projections now, I mean, in therapy. This would happen to me when I was four, when I was six, or birthing, or before birthing. And these are all, this is a vast projective field into which we, the mouth of the vessel is opened and the odors escape. Uh, yes, the, the, it is necessary to take, for some reason, it is necessary to take history concretely in order to believe in our culture that it really happened, that it's real, not that it really happened. In order for us to believe something is real, we have to believe it happened. And that is our, histor our way of reading history. In other cultures, if it happens in dream time, it's real if we're a runta of northern Australia. And you can't even tell whether it happened or didn't happen, or whether they're talking about the future. There are, there are cultures that where future tense and past tense are the same tense in the verbs. So you don't know if something's going to happen or if it did happen, but it's not now. It's in another time. So, you see, we for something to be real, we have to believe it happened. And that is what I mean by a, project, a field of projection. In order for you to feel certain wounds, you have to believe they happened. And I'm not denying whether they happened or didn't happen. I'm interested in the way the mind works. Whatever your psyche needs in order for something to be real to it. Whatever your psyche needs... I'll never get this again, so I hope it's recorded. Whatever your psyche needs in order for it to believe, I lost it, to be real to it, yes. And if you could look at your past life that way, or what you believe to be your past life, then you can, you're already deliteralizing it a bit, and you're already a, a little bit more free about it. Not, what did my mother do this to me for, but what did the psyche want by putting me into this box? And alchemy will tell you. You see, alchemy will say, you had to go through the negredo, you had to be, you had to go through repetitions, you had to, do whatever it is. And then you begin, you're interested in the process that the psyche goes through rather than in the personal psychodynamics of you and your mother. Because that puts more pressure on the psyche. I think it's because your focus is on the mystery of the soul rather than on your parent. You begin to realize you're parented by your own soul, that your true parent, you are an orphan, to use alchemical language. The stone is an orphan. 
and you begin to be interested in how the psyche is parenting you rather than how your actual parents parented you. And that would mean how it's taking care of you and how it's disciplining you and how it's rewarding you and what can happen now. And also, how do I honor my father and my mother as the psyche? How do I love the psyche? How do I love the psyche? That's a big one. We don't even think about that. We want to get all kinds of rewards, but the question is, how do I love my own soul? My own is a bad word, but our language is full of bad words. Yeah. Well, I think in the place that I'm talking now, we're in the Negredo place, I think it is a very incubational place and a very interiorized, mouth-stopping, vessel-contained place. Well, I think psyche remains in the, in the immediate world rather than in the projective field of my past. See, to think that by dealing with my mother and father 20 or 40 years ago is the world is an absolute fantasy. It's not dealing with a fucking thing. There's nothing there. Those are wisps, vapors. But it's how you walk out into the day is dealing with the world. Or how you, how you incubate the misery if you're not supposed to let any odors out into the world. See, if you're already working on it, this is a classical therapeutic idea, if you're already working on your soul, then you are preventing the odors from going out into the world. Now that can be carried too far, and you know I've been talking about that for a long time, but within this context I, and that particular passage, you are working on the world by plugging the hole. That's right. See, that's the whole point. The interiority is not just subjective. The interiority is alchemical. It's material. It's metals and, and stuffs. That's the beautiful part of it. You're not just working on myself. You're working on minerals. You're, and you're working on history. Because the things that don't want to change are history. That's why it's so hard to change. You're, changing, it's, you're not just changing yourself, you're changing your father and your grandfather. And boy, they're stubborn. 